You're listening to the Cyberwire Network, powered by N2K. Our sponsor, Collide, has some big news. If you're an Okta user, they can get your entire fleet up to 100% compliance. How? If a device isn't compliant, the user can't log in to your cloud apps until they fix the problem. It's that simple. Without Collide, IT struggles to solve basic problems, like ensuring everyone's OS and browser are up to date. Unsecure devices log into your company's apps with no problems because there's nothing there to stop them. But Collide works seamlessly with Okta to enforce compliance as part of authentication and complete the zero-trust security puzzle. Visit collide.com slash cyberwire daily to learn more or book a demo. That's K-O-L-I-D-E dot com slash Cyberwire Daily. A new tool from CISA helps secure Microsoft Clouds, JCDC, and pre-ransomware notification. CISA releases six ICS advisories. Plop goes everywhere, exploiting Go Anywhere. Russian electronic warfare units show the ability to locate Starlink terminals. Betsy Carmelite from Booz Allen Hamilton on the DOD's Zero Trust journey. Analysis of the National Cybersecurity Strategy from our special guests, Adam Isles, principal at the Chernoff Group, and Steve Kelly, special assistant to the president and senior director for cybersecurity and emerging technology with the National Security Council. From the CyberWire studios at Data Tribe, I'm Dave Bittner with your CyberWire summary for Friday, March 24th, 2023. We begin today with some stories from CISA, the U.S. Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. First, the agency has released a tool to help detect malicious activity in Microsoft Azure, Azure Active Directory, and Microsoft 365 environments. Called the Untitled Goose Tool, in what's apparently a whimsical play on the Cretan Liars paradox, this Python-based tool has been developed in conjunction with Sandia National Laboratory. It's intended to serve as a robust and flexible hunt and incident response tool. Untitled Goose Tool is available on CISA's GitHub repository. CISA's Joint Cyber Defense Collaborative is also cultivating its pre-ransomware notification capability. JCDC explains, With pre-ransomware notifications, organizations can receive early warning and potentially evict threat actors before they can encrypt and hold critical data and systems for ransom. The JCDC is a public-private sector information-sharing organization established by CISA in 2021. JCDC Associate Director Clayton Romans explained in a blog post yesterday that pre-ransomware notifications are possible due to tips from the cybersecurity research community, infrastructure providers, and cyber threat intelligence companies about potential early-stage ransomware activity. Romans added that since the start of 2023, we've noticed over 60 entities across the energy, healthcare, water, wastewater, education, and other sectors about potential pre-ransomware intrusions, and we've confirmed that many of them identified and remediated the intrusion before encryption or exfiltration occurred. And of course, CISA continues to release industrial control system advisories. Yesterday, it published six of them. Users and administrators are, as always, urged to review the advisories, assess their systems, and apply recommended upgrades and mitigations. A phishing campaign is impersonating Microsoft with emails that alert the recipient of an unusual sign-in to their Microsoft account, according to Avanon. The emails inform the user that their account has been logged into from an IP address in Moscow and encourage the user to click a button to report the suspicious activity. The report says, By clicking send, the user thinks they are reporting this activity for IT to investigate. Instead, the message goes directly to the hacker, 
This is where social engineering starts. The hacker will reply to the message, asking the end user for login information to safeguard the account. That, of course, is the opposite of what will happen. The scam's deceptive simplicity and the easy interaction make it effective. The Russophone gang behind Klopp continues to make a widespread pest of itself, a campaign in which the Klopp gang has exploited Fortra's Go Anywhere managed file transfer tool has caused the compromise of data from a wide range of victims. Major financing firms, energy companies, and even governments worldwide have seen breaches due to the gang's exploitation of the zero-day vulnerability. The remote code execution vulnerability in the MFT software, tracked now as CVE 2023-0669, was first reported by Krebs on Security on February 2nd. Fixes for the vulnerability followed on the 7th. However, it had already been too late by that point as data had been stolen. Many organizations have come forward revealing that they were victimized by this series of breaches. The record reports that the government of the City of Toronto, Canada, and British conglomerate Virgin UK's rewards club, Virgin Red, all experienced data exposure. Bleeping Computer wrote Thursday that another British organization, the United Kingdom's Pension Protection Fund, was impacted by the zero day. Several victims were located in Canada, with the Financial Post reporting yesterday that Canadian movie chain Cineplex said that it was hit in the attack, and SC Magazine is also confirming that major Canadian financing firm Investment Quebec was impacted. Procter & Gamble was added to the gang's leak site, and Saks Fifth Avenue confirmed an attack, according to Tech Target. These may be added to previously disclosed incidents at Hitachi Energy and Rio Tinto. Over in Russia's hybrid war, some traditional electronic warfare tactics have resurfaced. Starlink terminals used by Ukrainian forces are proving increasingly vulnerable to focused application of traditional electronic warfare by Russian forces. Defense One reports that Ukrainian units employing the system are being subjected to both jamming and geolocation by Russian electronic warfare units. Despite the failure of major Russian cyber attacks to work damage to Western infrastructure, Utility Dive reports... The U.S. Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency remains on guard against the possibility of Russian reprisals in the form of cyber offensives against the nuclear power sector in particular. CISA Executive Director Brandon Wales said Wednesday that a combination of effective defense, deterrence, and decisions by the Russian government itself have all contributed to the lack of effect on critical infrastructure. Wales stated... Recognizing that an invasion was likely, we were getting industry ready for potential attacks here at home. We have not seen that. We have not seen successful attacks on the United States from Russia from the Russian government. And I think that is a credit to the work of both government and industry partnering together to make sure that those are much harder to achieve. Activist auxiliaries have certainly been active in the Russian interest, but only at the proverbial nuisance levels. Criminal activity by Russian gangs, which might be characterized as privateering, given the toleration and protection it receives from Moscow, has continued at a high level, particularly with respect to ransomware attacks against poorly protected organizations. Security Boulevard has an account of what the deception specialists Lupovis learned from decoys it built and in place to attract a range of Russian threat actors. The privateers continue to show up in a big way. Coming up after the break, Betsy Carmelite from Booz Allen Hamilton on the DOD's Zero Trust Journey and analysis of the national cybersecurity strategy from our special guests, Adam Isles, principal at the Chertoff Group, and Steve Kelly, special assistant to the president. Stay with us. And now, a word from our sponsor, Know Before. It's all connected, and we're not talking conspiracy theories. When it comes to InfoSec tools, effective integrations can make or break your security stack. The same should be true for security awareness training. 
Know Before, provider of the world's largest library of security awareness training, provides a way to integrate your existing security stack tools to help you strengthen your organization's security culture. Know Before's Security Coach uses standard APIs to quickly and easily integrate with your existing security products from vendors like Microsoft, CrowdStrike, and Cisco. 35 vendor integrations and counting. Security Coach analyzes your security stack alerts to identify events related to any risky security behavior from your users. Use this information to set up real-time coaching campaigns targeting risky users based on those events from your network, endpoint, identity, or web security vendors. Then, coach your users at the moment the risky behavior occurs with contextual security tips delivered via Microsoft Teams, Slack, or email. Learn more at knowbefore.com slash security coach. That's knowbefore.com slash security coach. And we thank Know Before for sponsoring our show. And now, a word from our sponsor, SpyCloud, the cybercrime analytics leader. SpyCloud disrupts cybercrime by telling you what criminals know about your business and your customers, so you can take action to prevent ransomware, account takeover, and online fraud. SpyCloud constantly recaptures and analyzes new data from the criminal underground, including credentials, cookies, and PII siphoned from malware-infected devices. With knowledge of the specific data criminals have in hand from InfoStealer malware on managed and unmanaged devices, security teams can respond with a more efficient and effective process called post-infection remediation. Get SpyCloud's post-infection remediation guide outlining the seven steps for preventing a malware infection from becoming a full-blown ransomware incident. Visit spycloud.com slash cyberwire. That's spycloud.com slash cyberwire. And we thank SpyCloud for sponsoring our show. The Biden administration recently released their national cybersecurity strategy, which, in their words, aims to secure the full benefits of a safe and secure digital ecosystem for all Americans. For our upcoming CyberWire special edition covering the national cybersecurity strategy, we've got two special guests. Adam Isles is a principal at the Chertoff Group, the security firm founded by former Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security Michael Chertoff. Previously, Adam served as the Deputy Chief of Staff at DHS. Our second special guest is Steve Kelly. Steve Kelly serves as Special Assistant to the President and Senior Director for Cybersecurity and Emerging Technology with the National Security Council. We've got a segment from that special edition for you today, beginning with the Chertoff Group's Adam Isles. There is very loudly and clearly an emphasis on uh a fuller use of existing regulatory authorities and maybe the need for some new regulatories to um, apply a set of kind of minimum expected cybersecurity practices across critical infrastructure sectors. There's a sense that, uh, you know, what's historically been largely a voluntary approach isn't generating the outcomes that we need to, to defend the country and make it cyber resilient. Uh, and so um, what we're seeing here is certainly a focus around We have existing, whether it's safety or security regulatory authorities, let's make sure there's a cyber component to those. And and in fact, right, we we saw not even a day after the cybersecurity uh, strategy uh, was released, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency uh, come out with uh, new guidance to state EPAs, basically saying, um, when you're doing inspections of uh, um, public water systems, uh, here's what you need to be asking about from a cybersecurity perspective. And I expect we'll see that trend um, kind of percolate across into uh, other regulatory agencies as well. I mean, TSA has already come out um, and uh, announced, and they haven't divulged the specifics of it, but an emergency amendment to uh, aircraft and airport regulations to add in additional uh, cybersecurity expectations. I think something that's caught a lot of people's eye is this notion that we're going to see an emphasis on liability for, for software. Yes. 
And again, this is not a new uh, thought, but it is the administration saying in a formal way, uh, you know, we stand behind this. I mean, the Cyberspace Solarium Commission talked about it. We really want uh, software providers to be doing, particularly the providers of security technologies, is is to be, uh, you know, designing their systems to be secure, uh, secure by design. And um, and and to incentivize them to do that by having them own more of the liability uh, if for whatever reason they are. You know, the interesting thing in this space, right, is there, there are lots of compliance frameworks that are out there and best fra- practice frameworks. I and mean, we think, you know, in, in the context of federal agencies around things like, you know, NIST Special Publication 800-53, when we're thinking about, you know, compliance frameworks that are, you know, well-known in the private sector, we think about, you know, ISO 27001, you know, SOC 2, those frameworks don't really necessarily get to the level of detail on what good software lifecycle security practices look like. And so we're, we're talking about, you know, a, a um, potential liability shift coupled with, well, let's think about what a modern, you know, software security lifecycle framework looks like, and, and let's try and get people to, um, to conform to that. And so you see, you know, coupled with this idea of a liability shift, uh, you know, also the focus around using procurement authorities to try and drive, uh, you know, for instance, the software providers that are selling to the federal government to, you know, kind of attest to conformance with, you know, a, a framework like the uh, the SSDF. Software makers need to be taking appropriate steps to ensure that their products are built safe and secure. That's Steve Kelly. He's special assistant to the president and senior director for cybersecurity and emerging technology at the National Security Council staff. What, we, what we've experienced in the past is that Building a complex software product, like, a, like an operating system, for instance, is incredibly uh, cumbersome. It involves, you know, an incredible volume of code that's being written and assembled. Creating secure software is no easy feat. We recognize that. But uh, this administration, under the executive order that was signed early on, 14028, Double down on making sure that we have secure software development practices being used in creating software that the government is buying for its own uses. Uh, and that includes things like some foundational work done by NIST on creating software, secure software development practices and standards around that. Uh, and then also making sure that we've got transparency into what components are in software. Because software maker doesn't just write brand new code. Oftentimes there are uh, there are components that are borrowed and adapted from other places, including open source software projects. And so it's, it's important to make sure that you understand what's under the hood in a, in a software uh, product and that all the pieces that are in there are being updated uh, and security flaws are being um, addressed over time. And so one thing that is, has been problematic in the past, especially for small users and small businesses is that when you purchase a software product, you click through an end user licensing agreement, uh, which in many cases waives your uh, ability to seek redress if there's a flaw in the product and it causes a harm. Uh, We want to make sure that that the software makers are using all of the industry standard best practices for creating secure products and that as a result of that, uh, then that would create kind of a, a liability safe harbor for them. And so we want to in- encourage people to use best practices in creating software products from the start and to do all the right things to make sure that these products are as secure as they can reasonably be at the time of their release and that over time that those products are being patched and maintained in an appropriate way. That's the theme behind that section. And frankly, it's a strong message and it's, it's caused a lot of interest and concern by some. And it's kind of an opening of a conversation on how do we make sure that our software products are safe and secure by design and that they are maintained over time and that, you know, that, 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 that helps to manage. That's one big piece of managing the nation's risk. There is much more to my conversation with the Chertoff Group's Adam Isles and Special Assistant to the President Steve Kelly in our upcoming special edition on the National Cybersecurity Strategy. Be sure to look for it this weekend in your CyberWire podcast feed.
And I'm pleased to be joined once again by Betsy Carmelite. She's a principal at Booz Allen Hamilton. Uh, Betsy, it is always great to welcome you back to the show. Uh, one of the things that uh, you take care of there at Booz Allen Hamilton is uh, you are the Federal Attack Surface Reduction Lead, which is a long way of saying I think you help some of the folks at the, in the feds and the DOD for uh, protecting their assets. I want to talk today about zero trust and, and particularly how the DOD is coming at that. For, let's start off with some basics here. I mean, for folks who may not be familiar, what are we talking about with zero trust? Sure, sure. So we've um, we've talked a bit in the past about zero trust and really what it requires. We're looking at that assume breach mindset. We're looking at approaching zero trust as um, a longer journey toward uh, defense and, and protecting networks, and then also um, the mindset shift. That, that is required um, when adopting a zero trust architecture or reference model. Um, mm. And so, as you know, we've talked a lot about that since the executive order was released. But more recently, let's go back to November 2022 when the Department of Defense officially unveiled a zero trust strategy and roadmap. And it laid out how the DOD components should direct their cybersecurity investments and efforts in the coming years. What are the goals that they've laid out here for themselves? So there, there are two types of goals. There is a targeted zero trust level. Um, so, quote unquote, it's, it's to reach that target level of zero trust maturity over the next five years. And it requires a minimal set of activities they need to do by 2027. The advanced zero trust level is for the highest level of protection, taking you beyond 2027. And so there, there are also four strategic goals that come along with that. The first is zero trust culture adoption. DOD information systems are secured and defended. Technology acceleration occurs. And then zero trust enablement and the approach um, to zero trust enablement includes 45 separate capabilities organized around seven pillars. Uh, that those, those pillars are users, devices, networks and environments, applications and workloads, data, visibility and analytics, and automation and orchestration. And then mm -hmm. furthermore, there are 91 activities to get to the targeted zero trust level and 61 advanced level activities. Wow. Well, in terms of, of this journey, I mean, what, what makes this an important milestone along the way? So I think... For two reasons, many organizations ask those foundational questions such as, what is zero trust and where do I start? The, those, those questions you know, still are occurring after the EO because it's such a monumental undertaking. The strategy will go a long way towards helping DOD components to answer those um, beyond the executive order. And second, the level of details provided in the breakdown of all of those capabilities and activities really provide clarity where it previously did not exist. It's truly a path to follow. Do you have any specific examples you could share? Yeah. So, so if we look at under the user pillar um, in one of the zero trust capabilities, it's conditional user access. It has both targeted and advanced levels to achieve. And so the target state associated activities are uh, there are a couple there, application-based permission um, and organizational MFA. The advanced level would require enterprise roles and permissions and rule-based dynamic access. So the first should be prioritized in the short term. And then the advanced activities have a longer path according to that DOD timeline. Hmm. So why is this the moment for this? I mean, what's, what, why does, what makes this relevant now and, and where do you suppose we're headed? We see adopting a zero trust strategy as a key step toward defending one battle space. And, and I'll explain that one battle space. We need to see cyber, the, the cyber threat landscape in the same way our adversaries see it. It's, it's one battle space and when adversaries devise strategies for digital conflict, they don't view the U.S. federal government or the defense and intelligence communities, public infrastructure, private industry as separate targets to our adversaries. We are a holistic, target-rich environment. That's one connected battle space. 
So the pivot to zero trust and the pursuit of widespread connectivity come now as the U.S. prepares for a potential fight with China or Russia. And these are powers capable of intercepting military chatter and extracting sensitive information from systems. And those system, systems are thought to be secure. But as with zero trust, the mindset is to assume breach. Hmm. And then both with zero trust and international cooperation, um, they are both foundational to the Pentagon's joint all-domain command and control philosophy. And that envisions interlinked forces and databases across land, air, sea, space, cyber, all around the globe. I'm curious, you, you mentioned the timeline. How much of this is, is aspirational and, and how much does the, the DOD actually have teeth here that they can enforce a timeline? Well, I think, I think what's going to be key around enforcing the time, timeline is um, measuring the success and, and putting metrics behind it. And so we understand the Zero Trust uh, Program Management Office will develop and deploy a metrics-based approach, as, as do more, most organizations, but really adhering to those SMART objectives, um, specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound um, that can be used to measure goal progress. I, th- I think that's going to make it achievable. And you know, just recognizing how each of the components are going to go down this journey by 2027, I think sharing information back and forth um, among those components to know where, where have successes been achieved in, in that accelerated way and, and learning from each other in that process. Um, I think that'll be achievable. All right. Well, Betsy Carmelite, thanks for joining us. This episode of The Cyberwire is made possible in part by Nisos, the managed intelligence company. At Nisos, they help enterprise businesses achieve better risk insights and outcomes by delivering threat intelligence as a managed service. At Nisos, you can rely on their people, process, and technology to help you control costs while improving your defenses. They help you respond to threats faster and more effectively through assessments, monitoring, and investigations. Learn more about Nisos at nisos.com slash cyberwire. That's N-I-S-O-S dot com slash cyberwire. And that's the Cyberwire. For links to all of today's stories, check out our daily briefing at thecyberwire.com. Be sure to check out this weekend's Research Saturday and my conversation with Jerome Segura, senior threat researcher at Malwarebytes. We're discussing his work, WordPress sites backdoored with ad fraud plugin. That's Research Saturday. Check it out. The CyberWire podcast is a production of N2K Networks, proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. This episode was produced by Liz Irvin and senior producer Jennifer Iben. Our mixer is Trey Hester, with original music by Elliot Peltzman. The show was written by John Petrick. Our executive editor is Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. We'll see you back here next week. This episode is made possible in part by RSA Conference, where the world talks security. Through global events and year-round content, RSAC connects you to cybersecurity leaders and cutting-edge ideas for a safer, more secure future. Learn more at rsaconference.com slash cyberwire23.